Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's session. We are so happy to have you with us today. My name is Liji Thomas, and I'm on the Canaries team focused on strategy, and I'll be your moderator today. I'm also joined by my colleagues from Canaries, Stacy Guillen, Director of Business Development, as well as Mandy Price, our CEO. So a few housekeeping items before we get started. Um, first, to ensure that everyone can hear during the discussion and there's no distractions, please keep your microphone on mute. If you do have any audio or visual, visual, uh, video trouble, you can message Stacy and she'll provide instructions to help. Secondly, um, we want this to be a deeply interactive session, um, and so we definitely want to hear your questions. So feel free to chime in with questions, uh, ask during uh, not only the Q&A, but uh, throughout the entire webinar, and I'll share your questions with our speaker today throughout the webinar. Uh, third, I want uh, to let all of our attendees here know that this session is being recorded, and the recording will be emailed to all attendees after the webinar. Uh, while we have people joining the webinar, please feel free to share your LinkedIn profile in the chat so that we can continue to network and connect with others in our audience. Our goal today is to provide a space for courageous conversations and to continue building community for DEI executives and practitioners. It looks like we've had a few more people sign in. So for those of us who uh, are joining in now, uh, welcome. Uh, let me introduce uh, myself first. My name is Liji Thomas, and um, I again work on strategy development uh, with the Canaries team. Uh, a little bit about myself. Um, so, um, uh, 20 plus years ago, I was a young college. Uh, uh, graduate, worked as a paralegal uh, at a law firm that pegged itself as a public firm uh, in the uh, private firm in the public interest. And um, I actually, unbeknownst to me at the time, uh, the firm I was working with was suing Coca-Cola out of Atlanta. And unbeknownst to me at the time, um, Steve and I were, were connected, Steve Bugarati, who's our, our guest today, who um, you'll really enjoy hearing from. Um, so that was my first, I, I was young paralegal. My job was every other week. I flew from Washington DC to Atlanta, Georgia. We drafted affidavits of employees who worked for Coke um, and Coca-Cola settled for uh, $102.5 million, largest race discrimination settlement in history. And Steve will give you, uh, you'll be fascinated by the recounting of that from, from Steve's perspective. Um, unbeknownst to me at the time, it was really my first foray into the mountain of opportunity that exists in corporate America around this work. Um, I had the good fortune of meeting Mandy Price, uh, CEO of Canaries, uh, while I was consulting in the Fortune 500. And I was sold on to the uh, Canaries uh, vision of leading with data-driven insight, uh, employee insight, and that this can really make a difference in um, uh, long-term sustainable change in corporate America. So um, a little bit about, that's a little bit about me, a little bit about uh, Canaries. Uh, as part of our ongoing commitment to drive and promote inclusion, uh, Canaries uh, has created this multi-part webinar series focused on helping DNI leaders to advance diversity and inclusion, particularly dur during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, last week, we heard from um, someone at the Boy Scouts of America, as well as uh, Sam Santiago from the American Heart Association to, their, uh, to share their perspectives on DEI. And uh, today, we're thrilled to have Steve Bugarati, who is both a Canaries advisor, as well as the former Chief Diversity Officer of the Coca-Cola Company uh, with us for a two-part learning lab series. Uh, before I officially kick it off to Steve, I would be remiss if I did not tell you a little bit about Steve's illustrious background. Uh, as I mentioned, Steve Bugarati currently serves as, on Canary's advisory board and brings more than 30 years of experience to his role as president of the Bugarati Group, LLC, 
including more than a decade of experience as the global chief diversity officer for the Coca-Cola company, working across more than 200 uh, countries. Steve possesses a deep knowledge and practical application for all aspects of diversity, equity, inclusion, workplace fairness, and his leadership in this space uh, continues to stress a, uh, stretch across workplace, marketplace, and community-based initiatives. Um, importantly, during his time, Coca-Cola's diversity programs were critical components of the company's broader marketing agenda and were directly responsible for driving sustainable growth for its global brands and market penetration. In addition to the critical market fo uh, focused effort, Steve led work related to Coca-Cola's global women's initiatives, multicultural initiatives, diversity education, diversity communications, business resource groups, alternative dispute resolution processes and workplace fairness initiatives. During Steve's tenure, Coca-Cola's diversity, inclusion, and workplace fairness practices were recognized by external organizations as best in class, winning numerous external awards and recognition, including the prestigious Catalyst Award in 2013 for its Global Women's Initiative, which Coca-Cola implemented across all 200 plus countries in which it operates. On a personal level, I have known Steve way back before I knew I knew Steve, uh, back from when I was a young paralegal, uh, my first foray, foray into DEI work, to when I uh, helped build um, diversity and inclusion from the ground up for Southwest Airlines. I know Steve to not only be a giant uh, of a person in this field, his thought leadership is um, uh, rivals the best of the best, but he's also a world-class human being um, who I have been privileged to call a friend and mentor in the DEI space. So it is with great pleasure that I turn it over to our uh, guest today, Steve Bugratti. Steve, take it away. All righty. Thank you so much, Lizzie, and, and thank you everybody for joining. Uh, that was a long introduction and Lizzie was way too kind with that introduction, um, but it is uh, amazing how full circle she and I uh, go through all of this. Um, my time today will be well spent if all of you who are on this webinar come away with a bunch of nuggets, uh, nuggets of learning, and that's what I wanna do today is to share with you this first half presentation. We have a, a second half focused on diversity and inclusion on Thursday, but this first half is going to be focused on workplace fairness, uh, which I really think is the foundational aspect of this work, as you'll see today. Um, as Lizzie mentioned, I, I want you to ask questions in real time. I, I guess this is chat room uh, that you can uh, ask your questions in. Lizzie will see those and she'll interrupt me. I have asked her to interrupt me. I hope you will interrupt me with your questions. I don't want to just talk. Uh, I want to make sure that I'm answering those things that are on your mind. So please feel free. And so with that, we'll move into the presentation and I'll start taking you through some things, some context building on the front end. Uh, and then as we get into the latter part of this, what I call the money slides, which is really getting in depth into some of the things that we put in place. So with that, let's start right here. <laughs> this is not where any company wants to start, as you can see. These are the actual headlines that were in you know, these major periodicals from the period of time that Coca-Cola went through its lawsuit. So uh, April of 99, as you can see, through November of 2000. Um, I was the head of human resources for Coca-Cola's global marketing innovation function. I was 10 million miles away from this. Um, and, and had to experience it in real time because Coca-Cola went from being the company that everybody kind of went to, you know, your mom, apple pie, your Coca-Cola, to this, where all of a sudden these headlines uh, were there and, and people literally were stopping me in the streets or on the courts where I coached, the fields where I coached, saying, I can't believe Coke's doing this. And so these were some very difficult days for us, and I'm going to kind of get into the the, the meat and potatoes behind all this, but this is where it all started. This is real. Um, and I always start any kind of presentation with it because it 
kind of points out the gravity of the situation that Coca-Cola faced. So a few things again up front for context. What caused the lawsuit? There was a belief by people that our workplace was discriminatory. And I'm gonna talk about that in just a few minutes. Um, this whole idea that management decisions were not equitable. You know, every day uh, managers are making discretionary decisions around employees. Every day, thousands of decisions are made. And there was a strong belief that they were not equitable decisions. Uh, it was uh, really believed in the organization that nobody cared, that nobody was listening to employee issues or concerns. That if you had an issue or you had a concern, you had no place to go with it. So it started out very simple. Four individual employees didn't know each other, had nothing in common. They filed four separate charges of discrimination with the Atlanta-based uh, EEOC. Um, these were routine matters. And, and, and in fact, when you would do the uh, forensics on it, Coke probably would have won all four of those individually. Uh, that wasn't what mattered. The reality of it was is these four individuals were surfacing issues that were laying below the surface at Coke that were systemic issues of discrimination. And so these four separate cases of discrimination, somehow the four people got to know each other. The four people started talking. The four people said, hey, um, we should file a lawsuit against Coca-Cola. And they did, and we'll talk about that in, in a little bit more uh, depth here in a minute. So what did Coke do? Uh, Coke's mentality, the leadership at Coke at the time um, just didn't handle this thing right. Complete denial. Um, the head of legal, the head of human resources, the CEO, everybody said, no, look at how diverse we are. And Coke was. If you'd walk the halls at Coke, it was incredibly diverse. Uh, but we'll talk about why that doesn't matter at the end of the day in just a second. So Coke went into this bunker-like mentality. And, uh, and as you can see, here's what happened. 20 months of pain, press, and polarization in the workplace. It was, it was god-awful work environment. And ultimately, the largest cl class action lawsuit settlement in corporate American history to this day, $192.5 million. $192.5 million didn't go to share owners didn't go back to marketing, didn't go any place, uh, but to the litigation. So very difficult period of time. So there was this task force then that was appointed by the federal court to oversee our litigation settlement. Litigation settlement is in the public domain. You can read it for yourself. It's pretty thick, but it points out all the things that Coke had to do. And, uh, and this uh, group of, of seven people, they were a who's who in this space. The group was chaired by Alexis Herman, who had been Bill Clinton's Secretary of Labor. It included folks like the former head of the EOC, the former head of the Glass Ceiling Commission, et cetera, but really a who's who. And they were appointed to a four-year term to oversee what we did. Ultimately, in, in kind of a weird story, we asked the court to keep them in place for a fifth year. Um, because we found them to be incredibly helpful as we collaborated on what needed to happen at Coke. And so uh, this group was um, empowered uh, to oversee what we were doing. We met every four to six weeks for five years. They came in, looked at everything that we were going to do, everything that we said we wanted to do, and, uh, and they decided whether that was going to be up to speed or not and, and whether that was going to work or not. It was a really fascinating uh, experience. But fortunately, all seven people were very collaborative. They came in with the right agenda, uh, and we worked very collaboratively to make things work at Coke. But that last bullet says something, and it says something that's kind of important that was always hanging over us, which is in the litigation settlement, it said, that if Coke was not honoring that settlement, that task force could take over the HR function. Could just take over. They could hire whoever they needed to. They could do whatever they needed to to make sure that settlement was in fact being uh, followed to the T. So let me stop there just for a second, make sure there's no questions before I move on to the next slide. All right. So. This is Cyrus Mary. <laughs> this is Cyrus, uh, who was class counsel, 
who Lizzie worked for when she first started coming out of school. Uh, and, and Cyrus, when the, when the lawsuit was settled, the CEO and the CHRO at Coke uh, came to me and said, we want you to fix things. <laughs> that was the job, fix things. I said, no, thanks so much. I have the best job in the company. I don't have a background in this. Uh, this is a horrific time to come in. Uh, and then to my own naivete, I said, by the way, you've all noticed I'm a white guy, right? And uh, I'm not sure that's exactly the profile we need right now. Uh, they thanked me for my perspective. They said, you don't get a vote. Uh, you're drafted. You're going into the job. So the one intelligent thing I did do was a couple of weeks after I went into the job, I had lunch with Cyrus. Cyrus, a very honorable individual, good guy, does this for all the right reasons. We are to this day close colleagues. I will have conversations with him and vice versa because he doesn't do this. He's, he's not what I'll call an ambulance chaser. Okay. He does this because he really cares about what's going on in corporate America. So, um, I had lunch with Cyrus. I sat down and said, talk to me. It's been 20 months of protracted litigation. Talk to me. Tell me about what you saw from your side. And here's what he said. The very first thing he said, in quotes, because this is exactly what he said. I didn't sue you because of diversity or lack thereof. I sued you because you weren't always inclusive and you most certainly weren't fair. I think my jaw must have dropped about a foot and a half. We just settled this $192 million lawsuit. And he's saying, I didn't sue you because of diversity or lack thereof. But he gave me the clue. And he said, you weren't being fair. And I said, make that real for me. And he did. He cited example after example after example of the work that he did and the stuff that came out of the affidavits that Lizzie was taking that mm -hmm. pointed out where we were not being fair. And he made it real for me because he gave me exact examples. It was at that moment I sat there and said, okay, I get it. Um, my job is to fix that. Okay, diversity and inclusion is important. And as the story progresses, it became more and more important with Coke as you might see on Thursday when you join us then. But this whole idea about us not being fair kind of cuts to the core, you know, to have employees say, you're not treating me fairly, um, just kind of cuts to the core. And it gave me a vision that I then sat down with about 25 really smart people in Coca-Cola, because I actually believe it does take a village. And, uh, and I surrounded myself with a bunch of people and said, I want you to help me figure out how to make things fair at Coke. So that's a little bit of context with Cyrus. And now I want to talk about how we actually got it done. But let me stop for a second and make sure there's no other questions from participants about any of that context, anything tied to the actual litigation or anything tied to my conversation with Cyrus. Um, Steve, there is one question. Um, what did he mean by not fair? So I'll, I'll read a little bit into this. What does what did Cyrus mean yeah. by not being Coke not being fair? So let me give you a couple of examples. Hopefully this will clarify for you. Um, and and so Coke's lawsuit was predominantly focused on promotion or lack thereof for African Americans. It's class action African American or compensation inequity. <clears throat> Those are the two things when you go online, you see, do the research, you'll see that's what the lawsuit was about. So I said, Cyrus, make it real. Cyrus said, well, Steve, I, I started looking at jobs that you filled at Coke. So I would pull an, a, a completed job folder, you know, back in the days when we actually had folders. And he said, I'd, I'd look and I'd see 10 candidates up for a job. Uh, four of those candidates happened to be African American. Uh, three people were interviewed and one person was ultimately selected. In that 10 to 3 to 1 funnel, the four African Americans fell out. Okay? They fell out of contention, weren't even interviewed. And he did what all good lawyers do. He asked why. And Coke couldn't answer. Coke could not show why the African Americans were differentially less qualified than the people who were interviewed. And he said, I thought that was kind of curious. So he 
pulled another folder and looked at another job, saw something real similar, kept pulling folders. And ultimately, he saw a pattern and practice of African-Americans falling out. He, and he kept asking Coke to defend itself, and Coke could not. So he said, I had you. You were guilty by default. I claimed you were discriminating. I didn't know if you were or not, but you couldn't show me you weren't. I had you. You were guilty by default. And he did the same thing with compensation because he said, I would take a look at bonuses. For instance, I'd see an African-American and a white employee. They seemed similarly situated employees, same job, same level of performance. And the white employee had a 20% higher bonus than the African-American employee. He asked why, and we couldn't defend it. And he saw a pattern and practice there. So when Cyrus talks about fairness, those are the examples that he made clear to me over lunch that day. And that's what he meant by fairness, that given, uh, given the, the, the way the process should work, it wasn't working. And in fact, it was discriminating against African-Americans. I hope that answers that question. Uh, are there any other, Liji, before I move on? Uh, none so far, Steve. Uh, thanks for the questions and keep them coming. Okay, great. So how did we get it done? So again, we learned that the issues were beyond diversity. Again, people are telling us, look, programs aren't accessible. What do people mean by that? Well, some people knew about some of our programs and lots of people didn't know. Uh, people knew about development programs and lots of people didn't know about development programs. People knew about uh, potential uh, assignments, short-term assignments, other people didn't. And it turns out that African-Americans were folks who were not in the know about a lot of these programs and practices the Coca-Cola company had. As I mentioned earlier, there was a strong belief that issues weren't being heard, let alone acted on. But as you can see from a fairness perspective, it was about the in equity, particularly on promotions and compensation, that drove the Coca-Cola litigation. So we started with less than optimal conditions. I go into the job in early 01, um, fix a job. I have no job description. I got two vacant positions that are going to report to me, and we start. And uh, here's the reality. You know, we didn't know whether we were discriminating or not. And that all by itself is core to this whole discussion. We didn't know what we didn't know. We didn't know if we were being fair or not. We didn't know if we were being inclusive or not. We had no way of knowing because we had no way to measure that. And the reality of it was, is Coke was absolutely discriminating. I went and did work, forensic work afterwards and uh, studied the original litigants and the original class action we were absolutely discriminating against African-Americans. And so I did what you know you would expect. I looked at promotions, I looked at compensation, but you know, I got a, a very broad background in human resources. I've been a career HR person for most of my life, not all of it, but most of it. And so I went to the head of human resources and said, I wanna study performance management. She said, why? I said, I have an underlying belief that performance management may be the linchpin to this whole thing, that it might be the cause of what's going on. She said, no, don't do that. You can't do adverse impact studies on performance management. I said, why not? It's the first time she'd ever said no to me. Uh, she said, you're not gonna like what you find there. Every performance management system discriminates. And I, again, my jaw probably dropped a foot and a half. She ordered me not to do the work. Um, I'm a bit of a mischievous individual, <laughs> and, uh, and so what I went ahead and did behind the scenes was I took the original Coca-Cola employee population from 1999 and 2000, and I went ahead and did the adverse impact study. Of course, I did it under uh, client attorney privilege. I had my internal uh, general employment counsel cover me on that, so it was protected. And here's what we found. Uh, we had, and for those of you who understand about statistics, okay, there's the whole concept of standard deviations. Two standard deviations means what? Well, there's better than 80% chance that you're discriminating and the company has the burden of proof to prove it's not. Okay, uh, three standard deviations, about 95% chance you're discriminating. 
for standard deviations. About 99.9%. In fact, for it put in English, four standard deviations means it can happen randomly once every 400 million years. So you're discriminating, okay? Let's put it in real terms. Well, guess what? Coke had 12 standard deviations when it came to performance management. 12 standard deviations against African-Americans. And guess what that caused? That caused everything else to fail. That's why we weren't promoting African-Americans, because we weren't evaluating them fairly. It's why their compensation was off, because we weren't evaluating them fairly. It's why they weren't being moved into our important uh, assessment and development programs because we weren't evaluating them fairly. So this is where we started. Absolutely less than optimal conditions. So how did we recover is the next general question. And I'm going to get into the detail in just a minute. Uh, one of the things that Coke did, which was really smart, and it was in the litigation settlement, you can read it, is that we said, look, you know, we are Coke. So we're gonna become the gold standard. Nobody knew what that meant. Not us, not Cyrus, not the task force, not the litigants. But we said, we're gonna become the gold standard. So we put a stake in the ground, which was really important. We didn't hide from this. My mental model was, let's start where we should start. Let's look at the four Ps. Let's look at our policies, processes, practices, and programs and see what exists there. It's what my team and I do today with all of our clients. We always start with a company's policies, processes, practices, and programs to see if there are issues there. Because typically companies got good policies, but the processes go askew or the practices go askew. So we had to do extensive review of these four Ps. We, uh, we put an ADR in place, uh, and I'm going to show that to you in just a couple more slides. Um, and we built this workplace fairness practice. The key to it is what I, you see there in bold is that the whole idea behind the workplace fairness practice was to put something in place to surface diagnose and resolve issues before they became issues. I want hey, to- Steve, can yeah. I interrupt you? There, yeah, please. have a question. Great, fire away. Uh, your question is, were there any consequences for doing the adverse impact study when you were ordered not to? That's a great question. No, I didn't get fired uh, is the good <laughs> short answer. I literally walked back into the CHRO's office that, and I believe in begging for forgiveness. And I walked in and said, I violated your edict and I'm coming clean. I did it under attorney client privilege, but let me show you what I found. And she was aghast. I mean, you know, she knew that there's always discrimination in performance management systems, so she told me. But to understand the level of how we were discriminating blew her away too. And she said, I'm glad you did it. Thanks for violating my order and go do what you need to do. And from that moment on, I mean, she was the best supporter I could have ever had. Uh, an enabler, made, made sure that I had everything I needed to to move forward. So yes, I didn't get fired. That's the important part. So, um, and then this last bullet is, uh, we decided up front that we had to communicate. Uh, Coke as a company is successful when it communicates well. And Coke, when it has failed in whatever field, it's failed because it didn't communicate well. So my focus was we need to make sure that whatever we're doing, we got to communicate it both internally and externally because we knew everybody was watching us, inside and outside. We were in the fishbowl. So now I'm gonna take you through how we did it. And as I go through this, again, fire away the questions. So first, we had to create a mindset because the mindset did not exist to Coke. I had to create this mindset that we need to focus on workplace fairness had to define what workplace fairness was, had to make it real for people as Cyrus made it real for me. And it starts with program and data monitoring, okay? I had a mentor who told me that God is in the details and data monitoring and data does not lie. People can try to make it lie, but it doesn't lie. And so you see that little sub bullet, triage versus forensics. What the heck does that mean? 
So I gathered these 25 people in a conference room, really smart people. I said, I have a vision. I want to measure every single thing that touches an employee to make sure that we're being fair and equitable in that decision making. I want to make sure everything that touches them is fair and equitable. And as much as possible, I want to do it through triage, not forensics. So everybody looked at me like I was from Mars. I said, what's that mean, Steve? And I, I said, well, you know, think about forensics for a minute. A lot of companies do after action reviews. They will look at how they have distributed, for instance, bonus money each year. They'll look at the process. They'll learn some things and they'll say, we'll do a better job next year, right? That's an after action review. We've learned some things. This is what we can prove for next year. And it's good. But you know, it's still forensic study. And as my doctor friends tell me, one thing about forensics is the patient's still dead. You cannot revive the patient. So if you're making decisions and you're discriminating and you find out about it afterwards, well, the patient is still dead, okay? You haven't done a good job with the employee. So I said, I want you to help me think, how can we triage? How can we build systems and processes that allow us to figure out if we're about to discriminate before we discriminate so that we can fix things. And so that's the difference between triage and forensics. The other piece, again, use data. Language of leaders. Leaders make decisions in companies on marketing data, sales data, quality data, financial data. Keep the exact same thing in place for this work. We didn't have systems, we didn't have infrastructure, we didn't have HR capability in this space, so we had to build that up front. Um, we had to build these business routines. I wanted everything done as much as possible with exactly how we normally conducted business. I didn't want this to be a bolt on. I didn't want people to look at this as some uh, you know, auxiliary practice or work that we do. I wanted it to be built into exactly how we run the business every day. So whatever the process was, or the practice was, or the program, let's build this fairness piece into that. Steve, we do have an additional question. Great. Uh, the question is, were you surprised at all by which internal stakeholders were most supportive or least supportive of these efforts? Great question. Um, was I surprised? Yeah, in certain respects. Um, I was surprised. You, you know, you, you, you had some people who um, I needed to be allies early. I needed to be champions early. And they were reluctant, hesitant uh, to do that. Um, I had other people who, from the get-go, uh, were really important to being the echo chamber or being the champion who up front led from the front. Um, when I talk on Thursday in the Thursday session about the whole DNI piece, you'll hear a lot about those leaders who I believe made a difference and why they made a difference. But in this particular space, um, the fact that I ended up having leadership um, for the most part, supportive of what we did and kind of quashing the naysayers um, mattered. And ultimately, as we did the work in year one, we quieted the naysayers because as we would, through triage, find potential problems, okay? And I'm gonna go through this in detail in a minute, so hold tight. Um, they would learn, God, you have protected me. You have saved me from potentially doing something discriminatory. And so the naysayers ended up joining the bandwagon on this. But thank you. Great question. So last couple of bullets there. Um, really important to create the metrics and reporting routines. We put a serious metrics routine in place and a serious reporting routine and from that time on, the executives would not move forward with what we did programmatically or process-wise without first checking in with my function, my team, to say, will you give us the go? Are we okay to move forward? Because we kept them informed at all times. So very important. And then again, the communications piece was huge. 
So, you know, it was uh, uh, foundational to our success. So now I'm getting ready to take you through the, the detail. So here's a really busy slide, I get it. But this is, this is the money slide. So this is what I mean by what we put in place. And I'm gonna talk it through now, granted, this is the 50,000 foot level, okay? But I'm talking it through, but it's enough so you can understand that there's a ton of detail, a ton of work that we did, a ton of work I do with current clients behind it, but this will give you a sense of things. So compensation. Coca-Cola has annual merit increases, uh, annual bonuses, short-term incentive, annual long-term incentive, stock options, stock grants, things like that. The way we built this in was we had all of the proposed awards were all fed into the compensation function, who then fed all of that data into us, and we did the analytics behind it. We did the, uh, the, the regression modeling, uh, to find out if we had any group that was being discriminated against. So we would compare men versus women, white versus non-white, and every sub-segmentation. How did Hispanic females do versus white males, et cetera, et cetera. We could study it by group. We could also learn if we had individuals who were popping because it looked unfair. Back to the example of Cyrus, if somebody looked out of whack with a proposed bonus, their name would pop. And it allowed myself and General Employment Council to then go to the individual manager and ask the Cyrus question, why? Why is Lizzy looking like she's gonna get a 20% lower bonus than Steve, even though it looks like they're the same employee, same background, same level of performance, et cetera, et cetera, sitting in the same job. It allowed us to ask that question on the front end before decisions were finalized. So really important that we started doing this with all the comp. Plus then we did an annual pay equity study. Every single year, we looked at every single employee's base pay and we did the same kind of regression modeling and studied uh, base pay. And if we saw issues in any of this, we fixed it. We automatically fixed it. So if Lizzy was 20% lower than me, and it was not defensible, okay, the reason wasn't defensible, we'd say, mm, not gonna work, and we'd automatically move her up to the same level as Steve. So that's the compensation side. Talent acquisition is a little different animal, very hard to do triage, but we did these weekly reports. So I had a report that came to me every single week, popped on my computer every Monday, it showed me what the demographic breakout was, uh, candidate pools, interview pools. Uh, it broke it down by, you, you name it, with sliced and diced by function, by grade, uh, all kinds of cuts. And I could see what was going on inside the organization. And if something looked out of whack, for instance, at the interview pool for positions in finance, certain positions, it was 25% African-American, but the selection was less than that, and I mean substantially less than that, then I could go and ask the question of what's going on in talent acquisition and start looking at jobs much like Cyrus and Lizzie did all those years ago. And we take a look at it in the monthly aggregate. And the really critical thing that we did with was triage was the senior level review. So we said every job direct the level and above, uh, you don't own the job, <laughs> whoever you are, uh, let's say you were vice president, you had a director, the marketing job open, you don't own that job by yourself. The senior leadership owns direct to level and above jobs. And so we're going to have you uh, talk about the candidates that you want to put on uh, in for consideration. And we're going to talk it through as a group. And we're going to make a group decision about who should go in there. And I was in the room all the time talking it through with them and giving them the data, et cetera, et cetera. So we tried to cover talent acquisition best way we could, uh, even though it's not all triage. Performance management, we actually obviously had to get on top of that 12 standard deviations of discrimination. So same thing, all the proposed uh, ratings for every single employee came into the organization, who fed it to my team, we did regression modeling. If we saw anything out of whack, again, either by group, you know, black females versus white males, 
or by individual, uh, we could go to the function and figure out what was going on. And again, if it wasn't defensible, we would make changes. Uh, same thing with talent management. So the Coca-Cola company had, like many companies, very sophisticated succession planning programs, very, very sophisticated assessment and development programs. This is how we evaluated key talent uh, for upward movement, particularly into leadership roles. And so every year there were nominations for succession planning and nominations for these programs. And we would do the analysis on the proposed nominations so that I could go to somebody. And here's an example where I went to our CEO one year when it came to nominations for succession planning. Coca-Cola had, uh, like many companies, you were ready now, you were deemed to be ready now for a position, ready in one to three years or ready in four plus years. And when we did the analysis, we said, hey, this is uh, interesting. Uh, only 11% of the ready nows are women uh, and only 8% are people of color. Not much more in one to three and not much more in four plus. Companies fill jobs in a ready now world uh, you don't say Lizzie will be ready in three years for this job. The job's open today. Let's put Lizzie in the job. Probably not good for the company or for Lizzie. So it focused us to say, how are we going to change the composition of these pools? How are we going to accelerate the development of individuals? So the pools represent the population inside the organization. So a lot of work in the talent management space. Restructuring, every company restructures. There's all kinds of impacts, typically separations, but also demotions. And again, we wanted to see the proposed impacts. So before there were any kind of separations or demotions, all the data came in us. We did the regression modeling. If things looked like they were askew, we went and asked the why question. And if we didn't get the right answer, we fixed things. Let me stop there for a second, because that's a lot before I get into these last two things. Any other questions at this point? Nothing? Okay. Nothing so far, Steve. All right. Workforce demographics, well, no surprise, you know, and, and remember, I mean, we're, we're talking back at 2001 now. This seems normal now. 19 years ago, <laughs> we made sure that all of the senior leaders across our company, as well as our diversity councils, all of our human resources leaders, had a very detailed set of data to look at with regards to demographics, population and trends over time. What was happening to the trend line quarter by quarter, year over year, okay? What about relative promotion and termination rates? The key word is relative, okay? Here's what most companies do wrong. Most companies say, hey, we had 100 promotions and 70 of those promotions were men and 30 promotions were women, the female promotion rate. Now, let me give you a better example. It was 50-50. Had 100 promotions, 50% of the promotions were men, 50% of the promotions were women. Say we're equal. We got a great promotion rate. That's wrong. That's promotions out of the number of promotions as opposed to the number of promotions versus that population itself. So if there were 2,000 men in the organization and 50 of them were promoted, but there were 3,000 women in the organization and 50 were women, women were being promoted at a far less relative rate. And so you had issues of discrimination potentially going on. Same thing with termination. So we had to analyze these rates all the time. Same thing with the population and trends by business unit, by salary grade, the new hire analysis work that we did to make sure everybody knew what was going on from a hiring perspective, because those were the pools for future uh, promotion and, and, and movement. So these demographics were substantial. They were cut every which way. Um, they went to the senior leaders. The senior leaders, I, I told you I was a little mischievous. Uh, the senior leaders also saw each other stuff. I would literally put together scorecards and they would see how each other was doing, each of the senior leaders. And uh, they are very competitive people and none of them liked not looking good. 
Hey, Steve, we have another question for you. Right. Uh, this one, uh, again, is about pushback. And the question is, any pushback, i.e. stay in your own lane, difficulty relinquishing control for these triage reviews? Yeah, of course you had some pushback, you know. Um, but, you know, it's pretty hard to push back if you're across the desk from me and I'm coming to you saying, hey, I want to, in all fairness, I really want to understand. So why is Lizzie getting a 20% lower bonus than Steve proposed? I, I, I'm here not to accuse. I'm not here to prejudge. I'm really here to learn because there may be a defensible reason. Here's an example. Defensible reason one could be Lizzie violated the company's code of business conduct last year. It wasn't a termination level offense, but the company decided to withhold 20% of her bonus next year. She knows it. It's in her file, it was all agreed upon. That's defensible. But absent something defensible, I could look at the manager across that desk and say, hey, give me an understanding as to why. And, and a lot of times, you know, they kind of, well, you know, she's just not as good. I'd say, well, wait a minute. That's not what the performance review says. And so, you know, we had pushback. Um, we had tremendous pushback, and I will talk about this extensively on Thursday, from white males. White males thought, and I am one, white males thought I was out to get them. Uh, a cadre of white males, that's an overgeneralization. Some white males thought I was out to get them. You know, this is about any, everybody but me. Go ahead, Liz, you look like you want to interrupt. Yes, yeah, Steve, that's a great segue to the next question, yeah. which is, did you have any claims of reverse discrimination? Uh, no. Uh, and by the way, you know, there's that term reverse discrimination. There's really no such thing. There's, there's only discrimination. You can discriminate against white guys too. So when we did our adverse impact studies, by the way, when we did a pay equity study every year, about 30% of the people who got a pay equity increase were white men because they were being unfairly paid. When you do this work, you're not doing this work only for women or people of color. You're doing this work for everybody. You got to make sure everybody is being treated fairly. So, yeah, we had some pushback. Um, yeah, we had people who um, just didn't agree with what we were doing on the front end. But much like me coming into the job, they didn't get a vote. And, and we tried to educate and show them why we were doing it, how we were doing it, how we were trying to do it fairly. And I will tell you, after the first year, never had any pushback again. Everything that you see on this page, we put in place in 2001. It's still there 19 years later. It is built into the fabric of how the Coca-Cola company operates. And there has never been any pushback other than that first year. And so the last thing on this page is Coke's ADR program. And I'm about to show it to you. Um, I took a year to build this. All right. I got a couple people working with me and I said, let's talk to as many companies who have ADRs as possible. We found about 30 companies that had them in place uh, with a variety of success, some very successful, some terrible. And we spent a lot of time over the course of 12 months understanding what made it work or not work. And then we built our own. Our, my goal was to build the best of the best. And um, so we wanted to make sure there was multiple ways for an employee to come into the ADR. Uh, and, and again, how do we deal with issues before they become issues? The last thing I wanted with our company was for employees to feel they didn't have a place to go. And so they would choose to go outside, either the EEOC or they'd call Cyrus or somebody like Cyrus. Just didn't want that. So this is the last slide uh, before we get into any other questions or discussion. This is our ADR process. There were three ways to come into the ADR at Coca-Cola. One, 800 safe haven, which means we had a third party outside the Coca-Cola company who you could call anonymously and raise your issue. And you could say, hey, this is what I'm experiencing, or hey, this is what I'm seeing for one of my coworkers. And that uh, company was very, very talented and uh, did everything they could to get as much detail as possible while protecting the anonymity of the individual who called in. 
We also had an ombuds that we created, and that came actually out of the settlement. The litigation settlement just said we had to have an ombuds. Didn't say what that meant. Didn't say what you were going to do with it, but it said you got to have an ombuds. So we created an ombuds office, and the ombuds office I want you to think about as a traffic cop, okay, uh, or air traffic controller. You could call in, you could go visit the ombuds, and you could raise an issue or you could ask a question, and they might be able to answer right away. They might say, oh, hey, yeah, that's covered by the policy. Let me tell you about it, and that might resolve it. Or they could then say, mm, no, this is where you have to go to get this issue resolved. And so the thing on the far right was what we called uh, the solutions program at Coke. And it's multiple steps, and I'll take you through it in a second. The key is, with the 1-800 number, they might refer to the ombuds, or they might come into this process. The ombuds could solve it, or it might go into this process. A lot of roads led to this process. So four steps. First step, open door, okay? Where we said to employ the best way to resolve an issue is to resolve it at the lowest possible level. And we think that, that means spending time with your individual manager trying to resolve the issue. If it's not resolvable with that manager or that manager is the issue, take it up another level. If you don't get what you believe is a satisfactory answer at the next level, go up another. So you could go three levels within your hierarchy to try to resolve the issue. If that didn't work, the next step was, we called it facilitation, but it was an investigation. Let's be really clear. We were just being cute. And it came to my team and we investigated and we investigated it fully. And we kept the uh, employee who raised the issue uh, informed throughout, which is critical to the success of the program. Not leaving them wondering what's going on or saying, God, did it go off into that vacuum? I might as well go outside to the EOC. Keeping them informed. We did a full investigation. At the end of the investigation, we'd sit down with the employee. If, if it was to be resolved in their favor, we would explain to them it was uh, to be resolved in their favor. We would tell them what we were going to do about it. Uh, there might be certain things we couldn't tell them. So if we were going to take action, for instance, against a manager, we wouldn't tell them that, but we would take care of it, <laughs> okay? And, and we would make sure that they understood it was being taken care of. If we found no cause, uh, we would explain that to them, and we would explain why. And, uh, and so that was a critical step, because then the next step and the next step after that were external. So mediation with the uh, with the external mediators was the next step. You could go ahead and say, I'm not happy with what came out of facilitation, the investigation, I wanna move forward, I wanna go to external mediator, which is fine. We could do that. Um, if mediation did not resolve this for you in a satisfactory way, you could go to arbitration. And in arbitration, uh, it's exactly what a lot of you know. It's external, third party, typically retired judges. Uh, and both sides would present their cases and then the arbitrator would rule um, one way or the other. Those were the four steps. The blue box on the side is important because we had these design questions that we had to answer. Um, why three entry points? I didn't care how an employee came in. I just wanted them in. Whatever was going to be the most comfortable way for an employee to raise an issue was all we cared about as a company. Raise the issue inside. So that's why we gave them three different options. Um, the number of levels and open door. Again, we wanted to make sure we resolved the problem, uh, resolve the issue as early as possible. And giving them multiple options to do that at that lowest common level was, was critical. Um, I told you about what facilitation was, who managed it. That was my team. Mediation, you know, those of you who know about mediators, mediators don't render decisions. They try to bring two parties together and they try to solve things. But ultimately, it can go to arbitration. And this was really critical. This is where most people thought I had absolutely lost my mind. Uh, we put something in place where we said it was binding on the Coca-Cola company. The arbitrator's decision was binding on Coke, but not binding on the employee. 
If the employee didn't like the answer of the arbitrator, they wanted to go to EEOC, they wanted to sue us, they still could. I had no loss of sleep over that because if they still didn't like the answer from an arbitrator and they went and sued us, hey, exhibit A from the Coca-Cola company, here's the arbitrator's decision. I felt pretty confident that we were good. And then the last thing there, employee costs. Every one of the 30 companies that we examined, uh, if you went to external mediation and or arbitration, you paid a fee to do that. You had some skin in the game, which I thought was nuts. And, uh, and I explained to everybody, no, why would we give anybody any reason not to go in and stay in the process? So there were no employee costs. Coke bore the cost of all of it. And that is the ADR process. And that is the end of <laughs> this set of prepared remarks right now. But um, I think we got a few minutes left and if there's any other questions, we're happy to answer it. Otherwise, there's a commercial on the screen here for Thursday's session. <laughs> Fantastic, Steve. Um, lots of kudos. Please send in uh, your show, uh, Steve, uh, some love over the chat line. Uh, Steve, thank you so much. That was fantastic. Thank you to all our attendees uh, for sharing your time with us. Uh, this is the last call for any questions. We have about four minutes left. Uh, Steve, you're getting lots of kudos here. Thanks, Steve. Great insights. Uh, so again, Steve, thank you uh, for sharing your thought leadership with us. Well, not, not um, for kudos. Like I said, all I care about is that those of you in the audience came away with some nuggets. Yes, I think lots of nuggets were shared, Steve. Right. Um, someone's asking, will this recording be available later? Uh, yes, this is being recorded and uh, will be sent um, out to uh, all attendees. Um, our next webinar uh, will be this coming Thursday, May 28th. Um, it is the second part of this learning lab and we will continue the discussion on how Coca-Cola became a best in uh, class diverse, uh, inclusive, and Steve, as you pointed out, most importantly, fair workplace. Uh, please follow uh, Canaries on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn for news about DEI trends and updates on any future webinars. Uh, any other final questions before we conclude today? That was a lot I had to cover in a short period of time, so I apologize if <laughs> rushed. Steve, it was great. We can't wait to see you again uh, on Thursday. Thank you to each and every one of you. Uh, Stacy's uh, sending a reminder about resources.canaries.com for further uh, resources, insta insights on advancing DEI in your organizations. If there are no further questions, Steve, let me just for one second too, though, sure. because I know people may have questions afterwards that they think about. Sure. So you can reach out to the folks at Canaries. Uh, they obviously know how to reach me, uh, and I'd be happy to, uh, to to hook up with people, you know, directly. Great. Thanks so much for that, Steve. Great. Thanks to each and every person that attended. Um, and everyone stay safe and healthy, and we'll look forward to seeing you again on Thursday. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you, Steve. All everyone right. take, take care. care. Have a great day. Thanks. Bye. Bye.